My guest today is Pete Rodriguez. Pete, how are you? Doing well, David. Good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, the audience may or may not know this, but you and I work together. We are peers in Microsoft's GPS team, We're both cloud solution architects. Um, and I've been there about nine and a half years. I've been with the company, with this team of almost a year. You've been here a lot longer, right? Yeah, I mean, I started with Microsoft way back in 1999, so it's been about 24 years. And uh, prior to that, um, I worked for a Microsoft partner right out of college. And mm -hmm. I did have a little stint at a, a major manufacturing company here in the Midwest where David and I are both located, but uh, I was only there for about nine months. <laughs> so I don't know if I really count that, but it was kind of the heady days of dot com, right? So we can all kind of probably uh, relate to that. But yeah, I mean, since I've been at Microsoft, I had a, a mix of different teams, including Microsoft Consulting, and I was part of the uh, Microsoft Technology Center for quite a while, um, and then have been part of our partner organization, as you mentioned, since 2018. Um, I did have a short stint as <laughs> someone more on the pure sales side, which was uh, a member of the account team. So there's a role called account technology strategist. Mm -hmm. uh, we can definitely talk about that. But yeah, I've been a cloud solution architect for, since uh, 2015, David. That's interesting that uh, it sounds like even counting that brief stint at the manufacturing company in since in uh, several decades, you've only had three companies that you've worked for. That's right. And uh, 24 years at one, but in the 24 years, you had a d number of different roles who changed jobs. You just didn't change companies, but you were able to change jobs a bunch of times. And I kind of yes. want to talk about that. I want to talk about the uh, just there's a lot of people that are getting into technology as a career, and uh, they, they could learn from somebody like you that's, that's, that's done a lot yeah. of different jobs. And some of them probably were really good, and some of them were uh, not the right fit for you. Um, let's 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 start with just. Um, if somebody's getting into technology, what's the um, what, what kind of jobs should they be looking for? What, should, what questions should they be asking themselves? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the first things to ask yourself is, um, you know, what's your passion? Do you really like being hands on and diving into technology? And that's your thing, right? Um, that can be very fun, especially if you came from a uh, a major in college that was mainly technology focused. I did uh, not. I, <laughs> yeah, and and that's not unusual too. I know a number of very successful colleagues, David, that maybe didn't even graduate from college, and it's it's actually amazing they've done as well as they've have. But you know, that's definitely not a showstopper. Yeah. Um, but yeah, well, I, I, mean, should, I should clarify. It has I actually, I mentioned in something called biochemistry, which is technical, but has yeah. nothing to do with computers. Absolutely. And, you know, admittedly, <laughs> the computing landscape was quite a bit different when I was in college in the mid 90s. Oh, uh, oh you know, well, the I was internet in college was... in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the internet was just starting, and I remember Java being brand new when I graduated and so on, right? But it is. It is exciting to see how things have evolved over the past 25 years. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just going back to your question, I think you know, deciding how technical you want to be. And then we can talk about a couple of different branches on that side versus uh, sales, which I know for a lot of technology people, sales is a bad word. <laughs> but, I, you know, I don't ascribe to that myself. I feel like um, with technology, you can somewhat predict what the output's going to be if you work on something hard enough and you figure out all the bugs and you, you might end up with something great, right? But it's, it's more predictable versus, you know, working with people in sales, which you're trying to convince decision makers what they should do. And if you're that decision maker and they're considering different companies' products, right, it, to them, it may not really matter. They may not necessarily have an allegiance to Microsoft or Google or Amazon, right? They just want to get the cheapest thing that's going to work. And that can be a, a lot harder to influence. And I think there is value in people that know how to do that well. Yeah, so you're relying on somebody else's actions to determine your success as exactly. opposed to your, you know, through hard work and you know, conquering the computer. <laughs> Computers are yeah. logical. People right. less, less so. Hundred <laughs> percent agree. You got it, David. Um, but yeah, I mean, another part of that might be: Do you prefer to be hands-on and delve into that versus 
working with people and building those relationships because a lot of decision making is relationship building and like do you trust the the company that is going to be uh, solving your company's business problems right there's less of a tangible aspect to that uh, compared to what we were just saying so then within the technology space i feel like another decision point for people and i've had to make this decision is whether you want to be a quote unquote developer, you know, focused on applications and building those versus someone who's more infrastructure focused, right? They may not be as skilled in terms of coding, but they may have to know a lot of uh, aspects of how the technology itself runs behind the scenes. Um, so I've in the way back in the past, <laughs> you know, back when Windows NT was a thing, you know, I I was a Microsoft certified systems engineer. What had was to I? Take some, yeah, had to take, you remember those exams probably, TCPIP well, and- did NT4 and then I did Windows 2000 and then yeah. I stopped. Yeah, it seemed like everybody had those back then. That was a joke. But uh, yeah, then there was the other one, which was the Microsoft certified solution developer, right? I, which I, was- I had that one also. Yeah, so you made that decision too, right, David? <laughs> you, I was you, more of a – sorry to interrupt, but I, I was actually a developer by trade. I enjoyed that more. I found it was a more a better outlet for my creativity. But I discovered after a while that there's not a, a, a split between infrastructure and development. I had to understand things like security and deployment. And mm -hmm. uh, at the time, the hardware was really important. And so I, I had to learn that stuff to become a better developer. So it's not really binary. It isn't really binary. And, and, and there are people that do get away with being more <laughs> binary, I guess. But I agree. I feel like it's better to know um, both sides. And, and some people do have uh, an aversion to writing code. And I'm not making a judgment on that. It's just what they prefer not to do. And if that's you, then you know, then you probably want to look at something that's more of an infrastructure thing. Yeah. Um, you know, we we're talking about college, and if you didn't have that background, it might be a bit more difficult for you to take that on if you haven't done it before. Yeah, um, uh, speaking of this um, non-binary uh, aspect of infrastructure versus developers, I would say there's also a non-binary aspect to what you were talking about before, this uh, technology versus sales. And I would cite our role as a good example of that. What we do is we deal with people a lot, but mm -hmm. we also are expected to be technologists. And so we have to learn both. We have to be able to uh, build those relationships as well as understand technology well enough to help people yeah, build their well, solutions. That's a great point, David. And in fact, so in a, a couple of points in my career, so one has been here in GPS, as well as when I was in the Microsoft Technology Center, we would work with a lot of customers uh, throughout the year or fiscal year, and but we weren't really assigned to them, right? You know, different companies would come in, we talked to them about a particular uh, solution area and basically give them what they need and send them on their way. And maybe we'd hear from them again, maybe we wouldn't. Um, th that's in contrast to some other roles that I've had where I was assigned a particular set of accounts and I was the person that they would reach out to. Mm -hmm. um, so the pros and cons to both. <laughs> I'd say, you know, the, the, the harder part with the, the roles that were more short-term relationships is that you have to build that credibility really fast. Yes. Right. It, you know, sometimes you may only see someone for a few hours and you know this, right? We we're on calls together sometimes and we talk to the, the partner and we have to immediately sh demonstrate our um, skills with them and show that we're the experts. And that's in contrast with times in my career where I've worked with large customers that, <clears throat> I have that time to kind of build that. And, you know, some you know, back before the pandemic, I could go on site to some of these customers and get to know them personally, have lunch with them, et cetera. Right. Oh, I miss um, that. I do too. I, 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 I like that. Right. I think, yeah. um, you know, you get to be friends with, with some of the customers that you support. You don't just think of them as, uh, yeah, a meal ticket, I guess. Sorry for the term, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> as, as if you're in sales, then you're gold on making sure that the customer or partner that you're working with is going to be buying the product. And 
And, you know, there are different ways to do that, but I feel like building those relationships made it more likely that they would be willing to work with you over a longer period. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, it's, you know, to, to contrast things too, <laughs> if you had somebody that was great to work with, you were more sad when you didn't get to work with them anymore. And conversely, if there was somebody that you didn't enjoy working with so much, then you were <laughs> happy to see them go. So like, yeah, that's the thing is if you if you decide to be someone who works with a particular set of accounts, uh, there can be drawbacks. And I've had both experiences. Um, sure. There was there was one company I worked with when I was more on the sales side um, as an account technology strategist that was um, working with or starting to consider moving to a competitor's product, you know, from to Google from Microsoft. And that was not taken well <laughs> by the executives above me. Right. We'll figure. <laughs> yeah. We were on weekly calls with VP level people to make sure we were doing everything we could to make sure that didn't happen. And it was stressful. I mean, sure. I think that's another part of being on the sales side that, as a technologist, you may not have that level of pressure from someone that is a partner level person at Microsoft and, you know, definitely has the ability to <laughs> get rid of you if they're not happy with what you're doing. And I, I think that's yeah. probably less the case if you're in a more technical role. I think we tend to see visibility up one or two levels, not four levels up. You know. Yeah, I think uh, well, I don't mind the visibility. It's that uh, it's that pressure to always be selling, always be yes. closing. <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, and so I my, I've thought about this a lot because I have opportunities to move into the sales world, and I've always my my response is always I don't mind sales being a part of my job. I totally recognize the company has to make money, um, and but I don't want that to be my number one focus. I don't want that pressure of having yeah. a quota. And if I don't convince somebody to to buy our stuff, then it's not. And and that taking that pressure off also allows me to be more candid, to speak more freely, mm -hmm. to say, hey, you know, these are the best solutions. Microsoft is a good company with a lot of really good products, but there are other companies out there that have good products as well. <clears throat> I'm I'm never you'll never hear me bad mouth another customer. I just it's there's reasons that Google and Apple and and AW, Amazon have survived so long. It's because they have. Some some good products and come, people like them. It's yes. uh, the same thing is true of Microsoft. I happen to have a bias toward Microsoft, but yes, and uh, I think that you know, in the past when we had different leadership, I think if you were in a sales role and you showed up to a customer with an iPhone or <laughs> uh, a MacBook or some competitive device, right, that was definitely seen less favorably. Mm. Um, back then and that has that's been something that has definitely changed uh at microsoft sure. and i know the you know you and i both being microsoft employees are going to have that <laughs> bias of how things work here at microsoft but i i do know too that not every technology company is like us when it comes to now how we can carry whatever device we want and um, if you worked at a different technology company they may not have that view um, yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't speak to that. I haven't, I haven't worked for any of those big tech giants except for Microsoft. But um, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm I'm speaking for my own philosophy, and it happens to align with the current state of Microsoft, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about when people are selecting their careers or what path they want to go down? How important is money? Should they be looking at salary surveys to figure out? Yeah, I mean, go? I think uh, you can definitely find that out um, through. Um, Glassdoor or LinkedIn, you can, because that is something that can be difficult to really get a real handle on is what's the salary range for a particular job that you are looking at. Um, and I think it is important to consider that because, you know, yes, money is important for everybody. That's without question. But certainly but, in our society, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing I, I've seen is that some of the more uh, financially compensated people <laughs> may be willing to put up with less job happiness to get those financial rewards. Mm -hmm. um, and because they may have a, a lot of pressure to do to perform, right? So as an example, you know, an account manager probably is experiencing a good deal of stress because the people above them are putting pressure on them to perform and to make their number 
right? There's a lot of emphasis in a sales role to not just bring in the revenue, but meet the scorecard. And, you know, at Microsoft, we still have both of those things. And, you know, it it could be the case that there's a strategic area that Microsoft is going in that maybe may not make us a ton of money, but it's an area we see longer term making us money. And so those account managers are going to get um, incented to build that part of a new business. And so, yeah, that can, and if you don't make the scorecard, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a conversation you're going to have with someone above you. Right. Yeah. And that, that isn't limited to salespeople. In fact, I just read a book by a Microsoft attorney. He's someone who's risen in the ranks to be one of the top attorneys in the entire corporation. Um, mm-hmm. And he did so. Uh, the whole point of the book is uh, I'll, I'll cite it here. It's called Never Far From Home by Bruce Jackson. And a really good book. And he talks about overcoming institutional racism and uh, the, the sort of all the microaggressions, the, the macroaggressions of being a, growing up a black man in America. But he's overcame those and became a really successful business businessman. But it also cost him two marriages, mm. and so there's this balance between your personal life and your work life. And in his case, it was his workaholic uh, uh, philosophy that right. made him succeed here, but not be successful in his relationships. Exactly, and I think I mean for some people, their job is their life, and that's yes. okay. But you just need to make decide that. If that's, yeah, <laughs> what are your priorities? Exactly. I mean, we do, of course, spend a lot of time every week in doing our job as we should. But is it the thing that defines you? And, you know, for some people, the answer is going to be yes. Yeah. You know, for me, like I do a lot of things outside of my job that are important to me. So I it, I happen to be um, on the board of a few orchestras. That was when I was in college. I was not just a computer science major, but I also majored in music. And that's important to me is to be able to do those things. And if I had a job that required 80 hours a a week of my time, I would probably not be happy with what I'm doing, right? So I think as part of what you consider important, you have to make those determinations. Or if you're starting a new family, right? I mean, that could be a large uh, time commitment and maybe that doesn't work for you to have a job that would be as an example like a startup it could be exciting to work for a startup company Mm -hmm. um and i have friends that have gone to work for new consulting companies that were just started and have done very well what's happened for them um you know they left microsoft they went to work for a, a particular a new partner and then they grew that partnership multiple places within the United States and rose through the ranks at the partner. And then the partner got bought out by a larger firm. And when that happened, they were very well compensated, uh, you know, to the tune of like $5 million. And I think, you know, good for them. That's great. And I think that could be something you want to do. It can be exciting to see something come from nothing. Yeah, I, I've done this as well. I, I I remember when my my children were young, uh, I had a job where I had cost I had to travel 100% of the time, and I ended up leaving the company and going to a local firm, a consulting firm, and uh, where I had stability, didn't have to go on the road at all, and I took yep. a significant pay cut to do that, but it was the right mm-hmm. decision. I regret it not at all. Well, and it could be stressful too, David. I know this too from a um, friend of mine is that. They worked for a partner and then the partner started to have financial issues and their checks started bouncing. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. pretty sure we're never going to have a time at Microsoft where we're going to get a check and it's not going to clear. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there, there's always pros and cons to decisions that you make. Yeah, uh, I did have a uh, I also went through that as well. Like none of my checks bounced, but I was with a company that was failing and a real small company. And uh, I know that after I left, a couple other people didn't get their last couple of paychecks, and I felt for them. Yeah. But um, but what uh, I left, what do you think about this idea of moving from company to company in order to increase your salary, increase your uh, – meet your career goals? It sounds like you yeah. have – you've changed jobs, but you haven't changed companies in the last 24 years. That's right. And, I mean, a lot of the reason I've not felt the need to leave Microsoft is because of the fact that Microsoft itself has – been through a massive evolution in the 24 years that I've been here. Uh, You know, when I first started, (laughs) we had a handful of server products like SQL Server and Exchange and, uh, of course, Windows Server, et cetera. But it's nothing like it is today. 
right? I mean, if you had asked me 24 years ago that we would be such strong proponents of open source, uh, you know, technologies like Linux, uh, even open source products that like uh, Postgres and, and MySQL, et cetera, I wouldn't have believed you. And, and I remember seeing videos back then because we'd have these large conferences and, uh, you know, there'd be a video of like Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, who were executives at the time, making fun of those things, right? Yeah. There's one, uh, there was a Volkswagen commercial way back in the early 2000s where um, someone picks up a couch off the road or a chair, I don't remember, some piece of furniture and it smells. And, and they, they, they drive for a little bit and they stop and they let it off the, the car, right? Well, they made fun of that video. And instead of um, a couch, it was a Solaris workstation. <laughs> pick up <laughs> because, some Linux and then yeah, pick up some, it smells. So, exactly. <laughs> so I was just like, it was it was a totally different time, and I think that's a big part of the reason I've remained at Microsoft. I, I feel like Microsoft does treat its employees very well, um, and not every place has that. You know, there are other companies that are our competitors that see their employees as being more disposable, and that's not a place I would feel comfortable with, even if the money were better, right? Because, you know, I've heard stories from friends who have gone to competitors and I hear the numbers they're making and it's jaw dropping, you know, uh, an yeah. easily an extra, you know, 100 to 200 more <laughs> than what I make. And, you know, I still feel I get paid pretty well at Microsoft, but I, I don't know if I'd be willing to make that. I mean, for some people, that trade off would be worth it, right? Because right. that's a significant amount of money. But I don't think anything in life is free. I think if you're getting that much more money, there's going to be more pressure and maybe your work life balance is not going to be what you want. Yeah, and there's also the risk, you know, there's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Because you, you you know what you have here, uh, which excites some people. But that's the yeah. challenge of moving into a new organization, a new role is um, it just is what motivates a lot of folks. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think it can be harder not, I mean, because of course the technology is going to be different if you go to a different technology company. So say I were to go to Google, like their cloud stack will seem familiar and different. <laughs> and there'll be things that I would have to pick up. And I, I would be less concerned about that. I think just knowing the corporate culture and knowing how they operate would yeah. take quite a bit of time to get used to. Um, and I, you know, anecdotally, I've, I have friends, it seems like a simple thing, but one of the beautiful things that my, about Microsoft is that we can do what we want with the hardware we get from Microsoft. And so if you want to uh, redo your laptop because it's not performing well, you can erase it and redo the operating system yourself and, and get back up and running. Probably and, should be you, doing that once a year. <laughs> yeah, probably should. Uh, or you could bring your buy your own computer and and make it work with Microsoft uh, corporate, right? You, that's not allowed at some companies. Like we you have to that. use, yeah, you have to use the hardware they provide. And hmm. and when I was at, uh, I spent that little time at that manufacturing company. That was the culture there. Like you got a machine that you didn't even have administrator access to. Oh, and yeah. so you couldn't install your own software, which I found frustrating as a developer. Um, oh, I, I've been in that. I, when I was, I was a consultant for many years, and I liked it because of what you said before. Not you said about the, the people. If yeah. you were the with a person that you didn't care for, it's a, it's temporary. I liked it because if you were ever on a project that wasn't mm -hmm. awesome, everything was temporary. I was gonna move. To, I knew I was moving to another project, but anyway. Yeah. But I digress. The yeah, the, what I was gonna bring up was that um, I had one one of my last consulting gigs was a company that didn't allow their developers to have internet access <laughs> because they didn't trust them. Oh wow! To upload the source code somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> it was and really that's... frustrating. That is, I've seen that, and you know, some friends of mine that work in regulated industries, like pharmaceutical or financial services, you know, there's software scanning your machine to make sure you're not doing exactly what you just said. Like you can't just copy things to a thumb drive, or you know, that there's stuff to make sure that that important data isn't leaving your computer. And to me, that would be. Uh, I don't know. It just would not feel good. <laughs> yeah, I, no one wants to feel like they're being watched, I think. And I think that's a that would be an adjustment that I don't know if I'd be willing to do. Yeah. Um, we are but just yeah, about I mean, at time. Is oh, okay. there anything that we haven't talked about that you think we should? Uh, I mean, I, I think one thing, too, to, to quickly bring up before we finish is, you know, if you're in a, a job currently that maybe 
you're not being challenged enough, or maybe it's not the technology area uh, that you thought you'd enjoy doing. And I've I've had this discussion with friends. It's like maybe they're they're just doing, uh, and no offense to anyone that does this, but like if you were just having to do Windows Active Directory all the time, and that was your job, and you're like, hey, I really want to do more things with the cloud, or you know, then, and and you're not given that opportunity once you've brought that up with your manager, you know, it might it may be time to consider another job. We either and if you can't get that opportunity in the company you're in then maybe you look outside and because uh, like there are a lot of exciting areas we've seen recently. I know there's been a lot of press about AI and if that was something like I really want to do AI, but you're an exchange administrator right now. <laughs> that might be hard to convince somebody that you're the right person, right? And so you'd have to think about, well, how am I going to get from this point to this point? Or if you were someone who wanted to start doing more sales because maybe you have some kids that are going to go off to college, right? And, and you need that extra money. Then you'd have to, I, for me, that was very valuable, even though I didn't do the job for very long. I was an account TS for two years, uh, but just to see how all the parts of Microsoft work together in terms of, you, you know, we mentioned Microsoft Consulting, but there's still support and there's licensing and and then we have the account team side and then we have the partner side and to see how the sausage is made when it comes to a particular customer. I wouldn't have gotten that level of uh, depth in terms of how that all works together had I not done that role. Interesting. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we could go on and on about this. This is a big topic, but uh, I think we covered a lot of good points. I appreciate your time, Pete. Absolutely, David. It's great to chat today. I've been fortunate that some of my best friends that I still have today are technology experts that I've known for 20 plus years. And I think part of that is because I've been with the same company for so long that I've formed those deep relationships. And so, yeah, it's not uncommon for us to get together outside of work. And I'm, I feel very lucky to have that in my life. <laughs>